Um, so, my name is Julianne Gentoire. I'm a member of parliament for the Green Party. I was elected in 2011. And uh, as you can hear from my accent, I wasn't born in New Zealand. I actually uh, moved to Los Angeles when I was about seven years old. And uh, after I moved to Los Angeles, which is a very car dependent city, infamously car dependent, I always really struggled with being active and my weight was a real struggle until I was about, you know, maybe 14, 15, and I was old enough to walk really long distances, really miserable long walks along really big arterial roads with loud, polluting cars. And I was usually the only person walking. And you know, teenagers really don't like to be the only person doing anything. Um, so when I was 16, we moved to a small town in Minnesota, and I got my driver's license, and I got my first car when I was 17. And then by the time I was 20, I was really struggling with my weight. I was very overweight. And uh, you know, I, I realized I had to do something about it. And when I was 20, I made some really big changes to my diet and to my lifestyle. And when uh, about six months after my 20th birthday, I went with my family on a bicycle tour in Ireland. And I never really looked back. I just thought when I was out there that bicycling is really the best possible way to get around. But I suppose because of that, because of growing up in Southern California and um, you know, being out there on a bicycle and just you know, seeing how dangerous it is. You know, you really have to overcome those barriers to get used to getting around on a bike. Um, it led me to a profession in urban planning and transportation planning. I remember being a little kid in Los Angeles and asking my parents who both worked as health professionals, why don't we have trains? And they said to me, oh, it'd be too expensive. Of course, they, don't, they didn't really know the answer. But I, I thought, well, how could that be? How could it be that public transport be more expensive than every person having to own their own car. So I set out on this journey, became an urban planner, moved to New Zealand, uh, and one thing led to another, and I ended up as a member of parliament. The talk I'm going to give you is one that I would have given you know, before becoming a politician, just when I was working as a transportation consultant. Of course, um, I ended up moving to New Zealand in 2006, and to my dismay, I found out that just like in Los Angeles, in New Zealand, most people need to use a car to get most places. Did you say that's true? And we heard from Simon about all the health impacts of that, all the potential health benefits that we're missing. And of course, you would think, since I'm in the Green Party, obviously I might be talking to you about the pollution and the, um, the negative environmental impacts of everyone having to own a car. But maybe because of the fact that I'm a, a Green Party politician, so I have to um, prove my economic credentials all the time. Um, and also because of the answer that my parents gave me, I'm not going to talk to you about the health benefits so much or the uh, environmental benefits. I'm just going to talk to you about the financial, direct financial cost. Because the truth is that everyone having to use a car to get most places costs us a ton of money. So we've got local government spending about a billion dollars a year on transport infrastructure. Most of that is on roads and road maintenance. Um, everybody knows where local government gets their money in New Zealand? Anyone? Property taxes or rates? Yep, so rate payers, not road users. Rate payers are paying that billion dollars. Uh, central government spends about $3 billion a year on transport. That does come from fuel taxes and road user charges, the National Land Transport Fund. So all up, government spending about $4 billion a year on transport infrastructure most of it, the vast majority, is on roads and road maintenance um, and state highways. Um, but actually, households and business have to spend three times more than that every year just to use the infrastructure that government is building with your tax dollars. So we're spending over $12 billion a year on vehicles and fuel. And all of that is imported. None of that is produced here in New Zealand. So it all contributes to our current account deficit, this is almost the amount that we export in dairy products. So, you know, we're producing all this milk powder to get richer, and we're just spending it to get to work and to get to school and to get around. And obviously, if we can reduce that cost, then that's a direct benefit. So I'll just show you quickly. Um, this is about 14, 15 years of um, our fuel imports. You can see the blue line is the quantity. The oil that we've been importing hasn't really changed much in that time. We're not actually using more oil. But the red line is the value, and you can see that it massively increased. It's come down in the last year. To, so I think we only spent about $6 billion importing oil, but then we ended up spending more on vehicles. 
So the sum total was still about 12 billion a year. This was our vehicle imports. Uh, the blue line, again, is the number of vehicles, and the red line is the value of them. And so we were spending um, over uh, $3 billion, um, 3 to $4 billion a year on vehicles, and that's actually gone up to about $6 billion. So the sum total is still about $12 billion a year. And uh, you know, despite all of the money we're spending on transport, we still hear that congestion is costing us billions of dollars a year, particularly in Auckland. But of course, these traffic jams, they actually only happen a couple hours a day. We've got a lot of infrastructure that sits empty a lot of the day. And I guess the real problem with our transport system uh, being car-based is that cars are a really space inefficient way to move people through dense areas. And we saw a similar graphic from Simon. Um, 60 people in a car causes a traffic jam. Same number of people can fit on a bus. And, um, and on bicycles, they obviously take up a lot less space. And of course, on bicycles and on foot, they cost a lot less money to provide infrastructure for. So this is uh, work that I did when I was a consultant for NZTA. We did a business case for walking and cycling. We said to move one person, one kilometer in a car, costs eight times more than moving that same person a kilometer on a bicycle. Um, or, and that's about twice as much as somebody walking. So, the cost of the infrastructure directly is simply much higher for cars. And that makes sense, because they weigh you know, one and a half, two tons. Uh, they take up a lot of space. Um, you, you, know, you require a lot more road maintenance when you've got those heavy vehicles on the bitumen. Um, and I often hear, of course, that um, you know, we couldn't possibly, public transport couldn't work in Auckland or couldn't work in New Zealand because of the weather or because of topography. Um, or it's just too expensive. But um, the other thing I hear is we don't have a big enough population. You need to be like Hong Kong or London. You need you know, tens of millions of people if you want public transport to work. Um, but this is a graph that shows population and public transport use in Auckland going back to 1925. And you can see that the blue line is the population. And the pink line is the number of people taking public transport trips, whether they be um, trams or buses or ferries or trains. Um, and you can see that even when the population was much smaller in Auckland, um, we had much greater use of public transport. Uh, public transport is starting to catch up now. I think we finally surpassed uh, the number of trips that were taken in the 1950s just now in Auckland, even though the population is much greater. So per capita, it's, it's, a, many, it's a much lower number of people taking public transport. So, um, but of course, you know, 100 years ago, or 90 years ago, we had the same weather, we had the same topography, we had a much smaller population, and yet people were able to take public transport. So, why is it that it's not working now? So many people have to use a car. Does anyone want to guess? So what I hear is that New Zealanders just love their cars. <laughs> The car came along and it was so attractive, it doesn't matter uh, you know, how much it costs, they're always going to drive. I apologize for this graphic. Um, this is an actual, it's an actual advertisement by BMW, very sexist, it's awful. Um, but if you look up, so, I, so I've heard that people love their cars, right? And it's more convenient, so even though it's more expensive, they're always just going to take cars. But if you look at the quote at the top of this slide, Human activities necessarily result in vehicle trips. Does that, does that sound right to you? Does that sound like a law of physics or of biology? Obviously not. Um, wh where might this idea have come from? I'm, I'm going to give you a hint. This quote was taken from a document that helped shape how development occurred in uh, part of Auckland, in, in West Auckland. Does anyone want to guess wh where this might have come from? This was amazing. I was working as a consultant for Waitakere District Council before it became part of Auckland, uh, the amalgamated super city. And um, if you look at the uh, district plan, which has all the rules about how development happens and how you know um, where houses can be built, where businesses can be built, how wide their driveways have to be, um, and how many car parks they have to provide, um, this quote was in an appendix buried at the end that everybody had to look at if you were going to build, if you were going to develop anything in Waitakere District, which, by the way, was officially an eco-city 
that wanted to increase public transport use and walking and cycling. Um, but, if you, but if you wanted to do anything, you had to look at this appendix, and the appendix told you how wide the driveway had to be and how many car parks you had to provide. And at the beginning, there was this preamble, and it started with human activities necessarily result in vehicle trips. And that was the worldview of the traffic engineers and the city planners who've been shaping how our towns and cities developed since about the 1950s. Actually, I'll just quickly, um, quickly go back to this. Do, do you guys see that big drop-off around 1956 in public transport use? Do you know what happened at that time? Does anyone know? We used to have electrified trams all over Auckland and a lot of other cities in New Zealand. Um, and in 1956 was the year they took the last one out. So, um, so and around that time, of course, we had the car-oriented um, transport rules, and cars were becoming cheaper, and we were planning for more and more car use. And this is totally understandable, because traffic engineering didn't really exist as a profession until the mid-20th century. Uh, we had civil engineers, and civil engineers mainly dealt with water before uh, we developed a sub-branch of civil engineering called traffic engineering. And so civil engineers, their job was to predict peak rainfall, or peak flows of water, like the one in a hundred year storm, and design pipes big enough to accommodate that water. And when you look at traffic engineering, they took the exact same principles of water engineering and they applied it to vehicles. And they're still doing this. They say, we have to, we have to figure out what the peak number of vehicles is going to be going down this, this street. And we have to make sure it's wide enough to move those vehicles through. Because the most important thing is flow. But I don't, yeah, I mean, not to criticize engineers. I work with a lot of great um, civil engineers and traffic engineers. But you know, their, str their strength is not uh, really people. It's not really understanding how people behave. <laughs> and so you know, it, it comes as a bit of a surprise you have to point this out. But, People are not water, right? They're, they're actually more dynamic Listen. than water. And they're going to make different decisions about where to locate and how to travel based on the price and the availability and the attractiveness of their transport options. And they're going to make different decisions about where to live and where to work and where to develop based on the price and availability of the land and the availability of transport options to get to those places. So traffic engineers unintentionally turn some of the most valuable land in our towns and cities into traffic sewers. They're just flushing the vehicles through. And that takes away from the space that is really useful for the actual purpose of the city. The actual purpose of the city is not people and vehicles just moving around for the sake of it. It's people coming together to exchange goods and services and ideas. That's the economic raison d'etre of cities and why They've been around for about 10,000 years. But when, in the mid-20th century, we started planning our cities around moving people only in cars, we took away uh, the space for exchange in the city, and we gave away too much of it to movement. You do need some movement around your cities, but if you're giving it all up, this all becomes movement space. There's very, this, this area for the people becomes, it becomes degraded. There's the noise from the traffic, there's the pollution from the traffic, and that reduces the land values around it. And so that tends to drive people away. And that's what happened in the second half of the 20th century. People wanted to get out of the cities because they became much less attractive places to be. This is Vulcan Lane. It's in Auckland. It's a pedestrian street. Um, it's not too far away from Customs Street. This is Customs Street. So they're both in central Auckland. Um, Vulcan Lane's a pedestrian lane. Um, it didn't always look like that. This is what it looked like in the 60s before it became a pedestrian lane. Which way do you think uh, is more successful for businesses? This one. And it's a nicer place to be. It's much quieter. It's a little haven in the city from some of the noise and the pollution. And you can see this is just a very cursory land value analysis. It's not, uh, it's not publishable to the standard of something that Simon and his students would do. Although, Simon, I think you guys should do this. Um, we should get someone to do some more analysis. But we did a really cursory um, look at land values, and we found that on Custom Street, which is very, very close to Wilton Lane, the land values for the same type of use were significantly lower than on Vulcan Lane. 
And these are two other streets, Lawrence Street and Albert Street. And so basically you can see a relationship, the less traffic, uh, the more valuable the land is. Um, and that type of impact, that economic impact, is not taken into account when the New Zealand Transport Agency evaluates the economic costs and benefits of a road widening project or of a motorway project. They don't take into account how it's going to influence the land around it and how it's used for other economic uses. Because traditional traffic engineering just prioritizes the movement of vehicles. It doesn't say what's the best way for people to live in and to get around the city, what's the best way to move goods around our country, and to reducing the cost, whether that is financial, environmental, or health cost. Um, and then there's these other amazing, other amazing planning rules. Um, this, this probably looks very boring, but it's actually kind of a life-changing book, The High Cost of Free Parking. Uh, it was written by an economist at UCLA um, who worked in the planning school named Donald Shoup. He's just retired. <coughs> and he was really the first person to study the impact of parking regulations on transport and land use. So for 50 years, it turned out we were requiring businesses to provide heaps of parking. Um, and we still are. We still are. If you look in your district plans, there are these things called minimum parking requirements. Bear with me. I know this seems really boring, but it's, it's really amazing because it is the single biggest opportunity we have to transform our cities. Parking requirements um, mean for every individual development that's going to be built, um, you have to provide a certain number of car parks. So have you noticed that most places you go in New Zealand, you don't pay for parking, right? Like, you know, you're not paying for parking directly at Heritage Hotel here. Uh, you're not paying for parking if you go to a warehouse. That land has a cost, right? So who's, who's paying for the cost of all the parking? Anyone? No, it's not rate payers. It's, it's all of us. Whether we use the parking or not, we all pay for the cost of the land that's tied up in parking. And it is enormous. It's actually the single biggest land use in our towns and cities. This is Manukau City Center. You can see the orange is the streets and the roads. There's a big motorway on the side of Manukau City. But uh, the blue is the off-street car park. You can see it's like a third of the land in the city center is tied up in car parking. Not because businesses wanted to provide it, not because people have demanded it, but because our government, our local government, requires it. It builds that cost into every new building. And it creates these beautiful places where obviously no one's going to walk or cycle. And this is the single biggest subsidy to vehicle use, actually, because the cost of using your car would double overnight if you had to pay the direct cost of car parking. And if you had to pay the direct cost of car parking and you were able to avoid it, many more people would choose to use public transport and walk and cycle. And we need to subsidize public transport fares to the extent that we do. And of course, so for you know all this time, planning and transport has focused on moving and storing cars. The cost has been built into all of our new buildings. So we're all paying too much for transport and we have fewer options. And it's made it much more difficult to do anything but use a car. And so it's not people's fault. We don't need to force them to get out of their cars. They're not evil. They're not selfish. I mean, you know, they want to do the right thing, most people, I think. But we haven't made it easy. And because those, um, those transportation policy and funding is all car-oriented, it shapes the way our cities develop. So people tend to think, um, you know, development happens, and then government has to provide transportation to and from the places we need to go. But actually, the transportation infrastructure that's available influences where the development happens. So you know, in the beginning, we had walking cities, and everywhere you needed to get to was necessarily accessible on foot. Um, then we had transit cities, we had electrified trams, and you can see that um, in the old shops um, covered with apartments that um, exist in many New Zealand cities. They popped up around tram lines. Um, and then we had the car city. And the car city means that people have to go, they travel further, and it, it makes it much more difficult to service their trips and their needs by public transport. And we certainly won't replace every current car trip with a public transport trip. But it is entirely possible for development to happen in a new way. So I'll just quickly flick over to some pictures um, to show you how this could happen. Because development's happening all the time. And particularly in Auckland, where it's growing real fast, or Christchurch, where we're rebuilding. Um, 
This is the type of environment that I had to walk around in Los Angeles. It might look familiar to many of you. Most of the space and the picture is being used to either move or store vehicles. And it's not a very inviting environment for walking or cycling. So most people aren't going to walk and cycle. This environment tells you, you've got to get around by car. But if we put more money, if we reversed our transport funding, so the majority of it was going first to new infrastructure for walking, cycling, public transport designed around people. If we did that first, and then we got rid of these crazy rules that require car parking, it would actually facilitate the development of shops and apartments and townhouses in areas where then it makes it easier for people to have the option to walk and cycle to get to the shops to go where they need to go. And of course, there's still cars in the picture, but um, there's many more opportunities for people to connect and to get where they need to go. Um, this is similar sort of big box um, sprawl, and it doesn't need to be that way. It's actually the planning rules that prevent this stuff from happening. And if we change the planning rules, and we change the transport funding, then people will change how they live, where they work, how they do business, and how they get around. And I don't think anybody wouldn't prefer to have this as an option as a place to live. Um, the market hasn't been providing this, not because people don't want it, but because of the way we defined and solved our transportation problems and the way our planning rules are written. But as I just have one final point here, as I think this is really exciting, I think transport infrastructure and planning rules prevent the single biggest opportunity for us to create much more vibrant and healthy towns and cities that actually benefit everyone in New Zealand, even if they will always be people using cars, they still benefit from many more people being able to walk, cycle, and take public transport. Um, but it's not enough to know that this is there are these technical solutions to our problem, that there's a straight up financial and economic argument for doing things this way, that this is going to save us money. Because um, as a professional working in the field, I found that just knowing that wasn't enough to change the rules. There's actually a need for a political lobby and pressure because other, there's so much inertia in the current system. There's so many professionals, um, traffic engineers at councils or planners at councils, um, local body politicians and central government politicians who think that things can't happen this way. And they're still putting most of the money into motorways that aren't going to solve problems for anyone, even the people who are driving cars. So we really need um, as many people as possible to be putting the pressure on and talking to your friends, your colleagues, your coworkers, your family about these opportunities to build the political support and to put pressure on the politicians to make this a reality. So, questions?